Widely discussed beliefs from feminist scholars theorise how gender is not inherent, but rather gender is something we construct and perform. Our biological sex, however, is constrained by the societal expectations, thus it can alter our gender performance. As such, in the Western world, traditional gender role identity constitutes notions of masculinity through a performance of aggression, assertiveness and toughness. Juxtaposing this, traditional Western feminine performances require a woman to be passive, nurturing and physically attractive. Considering this, I wish to explore how the female identity has been constructed, performed and represented within Saru's photography. S specifically, I will investigate the photographic practices of the surrealist couple Man Ray and Lee Miller, whom were renowned for their betrayal of unconventional sexualities. Throughout the late 1920s, I aim to investigate their representations of femininity through comparatively examining the works of Ray and Miller alongside interwar views and surrealist art and literature to see how they communicate underlying ideas of gender within surrealism. Photography is one of the main ways I visually communicate my ideas, while surrealist aesthetics are components that greatly inspire the work that I make. Thus, I have selected this case study to learn more about the contextual history of surrealism and what it represented. I believe this will help to inform my own practice and to consider the wider audience when making work. To begin with, I want to first contextualise what caused the birth of surrealism. In the years following the war, France oversaw a political upheaval to reinstate the traditional social conventions that existed pre-war between the sexes. After the formation of the Conservative coalition government in November 1919, social and economic programmes promoting a return to traditional values, particularly within the family, became familiar topics of public discourse. National regeneration depended not only on modernised industry, politicians often pointed out, but also on family pro productivity. Political support for programmes to restore traditional family and community structures affected citizens' identification with the post-war nation. Thus, the, the French government in 1920 launched two campaigns to stabilise and reassure citizens' concerns about the effects of war on, individual, on individuals and communities. Through using sophisticated advertising methods, the government crafted and embodied their agenda of returning to a pre-war-like society that emphasised well-defined gender roles, which complied and promoted the traditional expectations to their biological fr sex that France, that France wanted. These campaigns were the Victory Loan, then followed by the Peace Loan, or dubbed as the Reconstruction Loan. Thus, post-war France, in which the Surrealists lived, was rife with images promoting robust manhood and female maternity as evidenced in figure two. French painter Henri Labasque produced figure two to advertise for the peace reconstruction loan. The advertisement portrays a woman painted to be nurturing her newborn child whilst the men pictured behind are distant amid reconstruction work in an industrial setting. This poster demonstrates France's construction of gender identity and how that is to be instated in their vision of an emerging post-war society. Women are to be subverted back to the domestic sphere of raising children and maintaining the home, whereas men were to inhabit the public sphere, being centred at the forefront for rebuilding a nation based on power. France, and most notably, most of Europe, had established a clear national identity based on an oppressive and restraining traditional attitudes towards sex. This was not readily met from the citizens who oversaw a clear distinction between the palpable disconnect between the lived reality and experience of the war and this national identity. As seen in figure three, countless veterans who returned from the war bore visible signs of their participation, both physically and psychologically scarred. These men bore little resemblance towards the crafted concept of masculinity that France had built, yet ironically these were the men that were meant to rebuild their nations, like that scene in figure two. Masculine identities weren't the only gender that ha that the war had changed. Women's traditional roles had also been blurred with the called arms to any permitted men. Women now had the opportunity to partake in various roles that previously wouldn't have been permitted and engaged themselves with it, no longer being confined to the domestic sphere. Thus, France's promotion of social change to return to order was not met with ease and thus prompted the Surrealist insurrection in early 1920s Paris, led by Andre Beton, pictured. The Surrealists understood that the success 
of national entrenchment laid in demolishing society's backbone of rational thought. To achieve this, the surrealists drew upon the works of psychologist Sigmund Freud, in particular Freud's psychoanalytic dream interpretation of the unconscious mind, reveals one's true nature and desire, established the core philosophy of surrealism. Thus, Breton published the first surrealist manifesto in 19, or 1924, defining surrealism as a pure psychic automation through which artists should express their thoughts limitlessly and avoid the constraint of the mind. The surrealist development of the strategy sought to demolish government's grasp on an emerging modernist society through destabilizing traditional social and gender values. The manifesto to forged a new model of collective and individual activity that embraced irrationality, spontaneity and the unconscious as harbours of a new post-war society. The Freudian concept of desire being the core of our unconscious being was utilised as a weapon by the surrealists against social convention. They believed that in contrast to the conventional rhetoric of the return to order, desire could create a seductive and alluring alternative. To surrealism, the revolutionary effects of desire would dissolve the conceptual parameters between art and the everyday and between the dream and waking life. Yet it was surrealism's devotion to desire that proved to be their blind spot. By tapping into their unconscious desires, surrealism was a gateway for male artists to manifest their misogynic positioning of women and female fantasies. Thus, the female form was mystified, fetishized, and othered to project an object of their male surrealists' own dreams of femininity, making it the most common material for aesthetic exploration. How does the unconscious desire and aesthetic present itself in the works of Man Marais and Lee Miller? What does their representation say about the construction of gender towards women, and does this alter coming from a masculine and feminine perspective? To answer this, we must first understand the contextual milieu in which these works existed together, and through briefly examining the relationship between Man Ray and Lee Miller. The pair met in 1929, where Miller had purposely tracked down Ray in a Parisian cafe with the intention of becoming his apprentice. At this stage, Miller had already made a name for herself as a model whereas Ray was deeply ingrained with the reputation of a leading surrealist in both photography and in painting. Hesitant at first, Ray refrained from taking on Miller, but eventually gave in. Apprentice turned lover, Miller lived and worked with Ray until 1932. We have already established the limited positioning that female artists in the men's club of surrealism fell under. Surrealist and later husband of Miller, Roland Penrose, himself stated that women weren't artists they were our muses to art historian Whitney Chadwick when asked on the importance of women within surrealism however as Malier argues the common muse model lover scheme that applied to the female artists and partners of the male artists should not and does not apply to Miller she transcends beyond these parameters through her revision and feminized approach of the pictorial language of surrealist photography that challenged sexual and female gender boundaries from the beginning Comparing Man Ray's The Prayer in figure 5 to Miller's unentitled nude bending forward in figure 6, we can observe how both artists have crafted a feminine identity from their alternating perspectives. In Man Ray's, the image reveals a pair of demurely concealed buttocks. Speculated to be Miller's pictured, the model in The Prayer is publicly unknown. However, the timeline of Ray and Miller's relationship and Miller's apparent response to The Prayer in unentitled nude bending forward was made just a few le- weeks after and hints towards her being the model in the photo. The off-centre framing of the buttocks coupled with the position of the camera angle positions the viewer to gaze down upon the object of a heightened advantage. This provides the viewer with dominance and authoritarian gaze that extrapolates a voyeuristic and perverse experience. The photograph's dramatic lighting and skewed angle of penetration on the figure illuminates a sense of palpability. Coupled with the texture, particularly on the right buttock, it adds to the tangibility of the flesh, which derives out of fetish and objectifying gaze. The repetition of form has also been heavily considered from Ray. The patterns of two, beginning with the buttocks, hands and feet, emphasise Ray's analytical representation of the body as a collection of parts. Furthermore, the decapitation of the model removes any personability from the image, further objectifying female form and reducing it to a collection of parts. 
In comparison, Miller's unentitled nude bending forward and similarly features the subject of a female nude form like Ray's, yet the tone, do- uh, the tone differs extremely. The subject features a warped bodily formation that skews the viewer's certainty in what we were looking at. Arguably, Miller's approach of restraining such features opposed to cropping them out may connote the tight grasp male surrealists held over the female identity. The position of the camera angle poses a neutrality compared to Ray's. The viewer is positioned neither above nor below, but instead directly in the middle, which connotes an unbiased and unconfronted gaze towards the female form. This offers a softer and defetishized representation of femininity compared to Ray's codification of the female body. The lighting creates the disquieting effect of making the body appear to be gradually dissolving, which further builds upon the amamorous structure of the body, which compels the viewer's attention. This directly juxtaposes against Ray's tidy packaging of the female form. In both scenarios, Miller's nudist portrait is less available for a voyeuristic gaze than is Man Ray's. The prayer offers a penetrating and aggressive gaze stalked out by Ray that constructs the female identity as weak, sexualized, and repressed. Contradictory, Miller's figure demands that the beholder find his or her own way of seeing the body, as if from multiple points of view, as opposed to a more constructed male gaze on Ray's. In this multiplication of possible perspectives, Miller's nude suggests more of an integral whole, even if head, hands and legs remain outside the photographic frame. We can continue to see that Man Ray extended his voyeuristic gaze into their relationship through examining the later works of shadow patterns on Lee Miller's torso, figure 8, by Man Ray against Lee Miller's self-portrait, figure 9. Ray's 1930 photograph Shadow Patterns on Lee's torso was constructed from his portrait of Lee Miller as seen in figure 7. The original image showcases a full body render of Miller's nude which contrasts a much softer and integral representation of femininity that warrants likeness to, to Miller's own approach. Yet Ray's decision to adopt the surrealist reduction process by fragmenting and cropping Miller's nudist figure downplays Miller's femininity. In shot, in the shot, Miller's torso is positioned next to a window whose netted curtain creates a shadow across her skin. The concept of the torso draws upon an uncanny resemblance to an ancient statu- statutory bust, suggesting and reinforcing the excessive expectations of women as fictional muse figures. Ray reasserts masculine dominance through his male gaze, through his male gaze off once again, decapitating the female form and establishing femini- femininity as a neuroticized subject. Art historian Hilary Roberts regards the erotic beauty that Man Ray tried to render and control through the image of Miller's body. For Man Ray, Miller's body represented a canvas on which to experiment his exploration of female eroticism. Ray's misogynistic treatment of Miller's body portrays the unconscious desire of dissecting the female form in other in order to fulfil his own wants. In other words, the female body is repressed from Ray's perspective as a creative instrument for the male surrealist existing to serve them. Comparatively, Miller's self-portrait in figure 8 celebrates and embraces the remarkable beauty of femininity with assertion. Like Ray's photograph, Miller's stance within the image bore similar likeness to an ancient statutory bust. However, the inclusiveness of the full upper figure rejects any notions of objectification like that of shadow patterns on Lee Miller's torso. Miller does not shy away from the gaze of the camera, but rather she embraces it. Her pose exerts confidence in her own beauty as she fully embraces her femininity. I wish to conclude this presentation by summarising the construction of the female identity through surrealism from the masculine and feminine perspectives we analysed. Ironically, the surrealists pose themselves as as a movement set to destabilise Europe's return to traditional pre-war order, yet in terms of female representation as examined through the masculine perspective of Man Ray, surrealism only re-established fetishisation of women and reinforced patriarchal power dynamics, all of which existed pre-surrealism and was a part of France's return to order agenda as seen in figure two. This was something they sought to subvert, but yet they ended up placing women back into a constrained and sexualized role. Miller, whereas, uses the physical instability of the concept of femininity, femininity to critique Man Ray's interest in freezing and fragmenting the female body to emphasize the female identity as a fetishized object of surrealist masculine desire. Miller made a space for herself of surrealism by engaging in artistic dialogue with the man at the center of surrealist photography. Her works acknowledge and admit respect for Man Ray. She did not absorb his expressive misogynistic 
vocabulary. Instead, she cultivated her own pictorial language and left a distinctive mark in her photographic works that constructed a fresh perspective of the female identity as defiant and assertive, untouched by surrealist desire. Miller, via her active participation and detached observation, produced a structural dynamic of resistance and critique in relation to the fundamental ideas of Bretonian surrealism concerning female identity. As Whitney Chadwick explains, female artists that were involved in surrealism had two choices. They were forced to reject the male language of female sexuality altogether or to adapt it to their own ends and create a new language that spoke more directly to the female audience. Miller had evidently discovered and constructed an empowering feminized vocabulary that allowed her to capture surrealism aesthetics while avoiding the sexual titillation and objectification of the feminine identity that dominated surrealist works.